In the 60s, Tehran was a vibrant and dynamic city. Many young Iranians who'd been studying abroad returned home with their foreign spouses. Wanting to make sure their children were fully immersed in Persian language and culture, as well as complete fluency in English, a handful of dedicated parents took on the challenge of setting up a brand new school. The odds were against them, yet they were determined to create the ideal school for their children. Together, they persevered and in 1968, they finally launched their school. They called it Parthian. Parthian was right on the foothill of the Alborz Mountains. So going to school always felt as though we're leaving the city and going to another place. What I feel, I remember clearly, is that I was happy. I felt I could learn because it felt, it felt comfortable. And I felt close to all the people I was at school with. They really felt like family. Parthian was my comfort zone. I think it was, um, it was a cozy atmosphere. It, was, uh, it felt like home from home. We had a lot of water fights in the school and so just, just joy. We wanted them to be people who could accept all people, all religions, all nationalities, and not be bound to any one way of doing things. It was a really natural process to sit next to someone from a completely different culture and didn't really affect your friendship or your, your daily life in school. My mother is first and foremost an educationalist. For her, you know, education is not just, you know, learning how to read or write or, or do maths, but about um, what kind of human being are you and what kind of um, impact can you have in this world. Love should always remain at the forefront of your life. I don't just mean love, L-O-V-E. I mean everything that incorporates friendship, respect, liking each other, socializing, being prepared to help others, you know. And so I plucked out every single assembly. So we would be taken to these charitable organizations. We'd have events at school. And I think that sort of instilled the love of doing good to others. I had been teaching in the American system for a long time. And I was quite used to saying, OK, now you sit down and you do your work. And I could walk out of the room and come back and they'd be doing their work. You don't do that when you've got a school of Iranian children. If you walk out the door, you come back, and the whole room has exploded. Any time you set a rule, they would set about trying to get around it. And they were absolutely brilliant at it. One of our students became the top student in the whole of Iran for Panjom. And I just sat there and said, what? And he was actually bilingual. And then, slowly unrest begin to develop in Iran. Although the Shah did quite a lot of modernization, the resentment grew and grew and grew. The problem was there wasn't enough financial aid in the lower levels. And they could see all these middle classes and posh cars and everything. And we were included in that, you know, these posh Farangis there in that school. Well, the village would, was getting a little upset with our school because we represented the Takuti, the upper classes, the educated classes, and we were just not part of the village. Streets were burning, tires were burning, people shouted for the roof, especially at night, Allah Akbar. And, and it was a mad place, Iran, at that point. It was unexpected, and you just didn't know whether even you'd survive being there. From one minute to the next, the rules changed and you didn't even know what the rules were anymore. We were told by the revolutionaries and by the villagers that in respect of the revolution that was happening, we had to close our school. When Khomeini arrived, my husband said, well, you know, we will have a democracy now. And then Khomeini started killing all the people who were close to the Shah. And I realized we couldn't have a democracy. That was an illusion. I had this delightful friend named Gigi, and um, her grandfather had been arrested. And I remember I would ask her quite often, how's your grandfather? How's your grandfather? Because I knew he was, and she was like, oh, he's fine. They've said that they're going to release him. 
And then one day, um, Gigi didn't show up. And the next day, when the newspapers came, there was the picture of her uh, grandfather. There was a sort of rows and rows of pictures of people with numbers on them, people who had been executed, and her grandfather was one of them. And I think that, for me, was, you know, that was the moment where I felt, okay, the, the, we're dealing with something really sinister here. Um, and just the notion that, that I couldn't protect my friend, that this, something ended for me. Um, yeah, something ended with that execution. Parthian ended. Everything ended with that execution. I remember the day we had to go and we had to leave Iran, staring out of the window of, 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 of this car intently at every single thing we were passing because I thought this could be the last time I see any of these things. We'd lost that, that really great childhood that we had in Iran and you, uh, suddenly we, you know, you don't have your bedroom anymore, you don't have your things anymore that you grew up with, you don't have, you know, I didn't live with my parents anymore, you know, it was, and we were all separated and we were all over the place. My brother was in the States, I was over here, my sister was in France. My mother was in France, my dad was stuck in Iran. So it was kind of torn apart, like a lot of Iranians of that generation. Everything we owned, everything was in Iran. And we lost everything. And I, and I do think some things um, broke after the revolution and, and, and couldn't be repaired anymore and, and were, were too damaged. Um, and and we, we had to come to terms with those things and grieve those things. And, and that, that was a long process. And it, <clears throat> it took... Um, um, sorry. It, it takes a long time to, to fix something that's broken. The Parthian reunion was amazing. This was 30 years later. And man, when I, um, when I saw Gigi and I hugged her, it's just like, honestly, it felt, I felt like a cracked coin that connected to... to know that she made it, that we had all made it. Our world collapsed and we didn't. I think that meant a lot, that life survived. Living around people say, well, you, you left everything. I mean, it's gone. It's, and I just say, no, I can go anytime I want to. I can go in the house of memory. And I don't go into the house of regret. I go to the house of memory, which is full of beauty. You can lose everything, but you can still leave with something, and, and you can use that as a core, as a... And it's, it's not what you have, it's not the belonging, it's not the things around you, it's, it's, it's what you have in here, and it, it's what you have here that, that will help you kind of cope and survive and find resilience and, and, and find a way of, of moving forward in your life and connecting to other people and creating communities again and creating love, you know, and, and yeah... Um, whatever love means. <laughs>